Hi everyone, welcome. We'll just wait a moment to let everyone into the room before we begin. Okay, uh, hello everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, this installment of the SOAS Economics webinar series, uh, Intensifying Inequalities and the Limitations of Global Capitalism. Uh, this series has aimed to bring together perspectives that extend our understanding of how inequalities take root in our societies and economies and how these relate to the crises of global capitalism. These include contributions on feminist economics, racial inequalities, and economic imperialism. Uh, the series is organized by the SOAS Economics Department in collaboration with our students in the Open Economics Forum, the SOAS Feminist Economics Network, and the Black Economist Network. Um, today's topic is the flexible seamstress, global South suppliers, and the new economic imperialism. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alice Malavoir. Uh, I recently completed my master's uh, in the SOAS economics department, um, where I was an active organizer in the Open Economics Forum. Uh, today, I'm so pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Intan Sawandi and Professor Susan Newman. Thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, so, Intan Sawandi is Assistant Professor of Sociology at Illinois State University. She holds a PhD in Sociology from the University of Oregon. Her areas of specialization include international political economy, global sociology, Marxist theories, imperialism, labor, social stratification and development. Her book, Value Chains, The New Economic Imperialism, which I personally have been recommending to everyone, uh, it examines the exploitation of labor that continues to occur in the global south, particularly under the domination of multinational firms emanating primarily from the global north, despite the complexities and decentralization that char characterize global value chains in today's world economy. Uh, and our discussant today is Susan Newman, who is a professor and head of economics at the Open University. She's previously held positions at the University of West of England, the International Institute for Social Studies, Erasmus University of Rotterdam, uh, and the University of the Water Strand. Susan completed her PhD at SOAS on future markets and coffee prices. Her research interests include the political economy of industrial development, the relationship between finance and production, and the social relations of production and exchange in agri-food commodity chains. Susan is committed to the promotion of political economy, interdisciplinarity, and pluralism in economic education. She is a member of Reteaching Economics, the International Initiative for Promoting Political Economy, and Responsible Global Value Chains. Uh, she currently serves on the editorial board for the Review of Radical Political Economics, having won the journal's Best Paper Award in 2010 for her first academic publication on financialization and the changing social relations along coffee commodity chains. Um, so the structure of today, uh, in time will speak for about 40 minutes, uh, followed by Susan's discussion, which will take around 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll have time at the end for audience questions. So uh, I would really encourage you to put your questions in the chat uh, and I will try to get through as many of them as possible. So without further ado, uh, I'd love to hand over to Intan. Thank you, Alice, Thank you, Alice. for the wonderful introduction. Um, it's really good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's such an honor. And uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, so um, I will talk today, I will talk about my book, uh, Value Chains, The New Economic Imperialism but I will focus on uh, the case studies, which, is, um, which I'm excited about because usually in previous talks, um, I focus more on the theoretical part of the book. Um, so hopefully um, this is useful for, for, um, for people here. Okay, so um, 
before we get to the case study, however, I do want to give um, a brief uh, background about globalization and global, global commodity chains. So um, I think it is, it, it's commonly um, discussed that globalization is not a new phenomenon and um, it has accompanied uh, capitalism from the very beginning. Um, we cannot really talk about our current globalization without, um, without thinking about the conquest of the Americas, this colonial subjection of Asia and Africa, and all of these, um, all of these phases of globalization um, have the same goals. Samir Amin, for example, um, argue that the goals of, um, of globalization that accompany capitalism um, are, first of all, it's to control um, the expansion of markets and um, also to plunder Earth's natural resources and to exploit labor reserves in the periphery. However, we can also agree um, and scholars have correctly pointed this out that even though globalization can be traced from, from the beginning of capitalism, um, but the new wave of globalization uh, that started in the 1970s has distinguishing characteristics. Uh, the first one is an increasing trend of foreign direct, of foreign direct investments. So starting about 10 years ago, uh, more than 50% of global FDI actually went to developing countries. And um, even though there has been um, a decrease in global FDI in general, um, the inflow to the developing economies um, remain increasing. And the second trend is also a, the increase in arm's length contracts. And these are subcontracting, uh, you know, outsourcing of production without any equity involvement. And arm's length contracts also have um, increased dramatically. If between 2010 and 2014, for example, arm's length trading um, grew at 6.6%, and that's higher than um, the growth of world economy. And um, in 2010 alone, it generated about $2 trillion in sales and much of it also in developing economies. And another trend is that the concentration of world industrial workers in the global South. Um, in 2010 also about uh, more than 440 million industrial workers are located in the global South as um, compared to about 140 million in the global north. So combined, um, these trends signify globalized production with increased production in low wage areas in the global south. And the trends are especially noticeable in manufacturing. Um, it also leads to uh, the increase in, um, in global supply chains jobs. So by 2012, uh, global supply chains coordinated by multinationals accounted for about 80% of global trade. And you can see that the jobs also increased um, by more than 150 million uh, between 95 and 2013. And a lot, of these, um, a lot of these workers, again, are located in the global south. If you look at the countries where um, these global supply chain jobs are concentrated, um, the top three are China, India, and Indonesia. And you can also see here that um, uh, they have the largest share of all global supply chain jobs and the primary export destinations are countries like United States and Japan. So what we see is, this is what global commodity chains are. Some people call it global value chains, some people call it global production networks. Um, 
I won't get into uh, the explanation of, you know, because these this terms differ um, from one another, but um, probably it's not too important to highlight that right now. Uh, but when they are used interchangeably, it means a vast network of people, tools, and activities needed to deliver goods and services to the market. And in addition, each chain consists of various nodes. And each node signifies a specific production process. Um, for example, you know, one node is the acquisition of raw materials and then another node is the production of semi-finished products. Um, and then there's provisioning of labor, transportation and so on. So these, um, a lot of you probably have known this, that these commodity chains are very complex networks. Um, there was an article in Foreign Policy um, earlier this year that um, points out that no CEOs in this world knows their complete chains. Um, Volkswagen, for example, has 5,000 direct suppliers and each of the supplier has on average 250 tier two suppliers. And then um, combined, it's about 1.2 million suppliers. And that doesn't include the tier three suppliers. So it can be that complicated. Um, so you can see how um, the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic can create a uh, big disruptions. And it was actually dubbed as the first global supply chain crisis um, when the when COVID, uh, the first outbreak in Wuhan happened, about 51,000 companies in this world has at least one supplier, one tier one supplier in Wuhan. And 5 million companies have at least one tier two supplier in Wuhan. So that's just to, um, to show you how complex these networks can be. So the question now is that, well, the production processes are really decentralized, but does this mean that power is also decentralized? A lot of, um, a lot of the mainstream um, works on global commodity chains focus on this decentralized character. And um, a lot of times they undermine inequality that results from this organization of commodity chains. And another question is um, in relation to imperialism. So is this world economy imperialistic considering how global commodity chains are structured? Um, some, uh, some people argue that um, imperialism is obsolete because what we're seeing now is, is, the, is the shifting hegemonies, especially if you consider um, um, emerging economies, especially China. And some on the left even argue that uh, what's ha what has been happening is the reversal of the drain of surplus from the global north to the global south. So my study here tries to contribute to this discussion. And um, the conclusion is that what I found is that world economy is imperialistic. And um, this is how I came to this conclusion. The first thing, um, so the first layer of the study is, is you can say the macro level to examine the macro level of, of global commodity chains. I created this framework called labor value commodity chains and um, it incorporates the measurement of unit labor cost uh, because this data combines labor productivity and compensation to assess the price com competitiveness of a given set of country. So this measurement is important because it combines labor productivity with wage costs in a manner closely related to Marx's theory of exploitation. So um, from the data and actually this part of the study, um, I co-authored with John Balmy Foster and Jamil Jonah. And um, this was the result uh, we got. So you can see that there's a big gap of unit labor costs um, between a group of countries, United States, United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, and, and the Global South countries, including China, India, Indonesia, and Mexico. 
Um, what does this mean, right? So first of all, the gap in unit labor cost in manufacturing between key core and key periphery emerging states has been on the order of 40 to 60% during most of the last three decades. And this arises, this gap arises from a system that allows for the relatively free international mobility of capital while tightly restricting the international mobility of labor. So this is global labor arbitrage. And this process holds wages down in the periphery and make possible the enormous siphoning, siphoning off of economic surplus from the countries in the global south. And when we talk about node, uh, nodes within global commodity chains, now we can see that the node where final assembly happens is usually located in a country that has low unit labor costs. I mean, this suggests that, um, you know, from the standpoint of profitabil profitability for the economies of the global north to maintain substantial parts of their labor value chains in poor and emerging economies. And the result is a much higher rates of exploitation in the global south and um, also much higher profit margins for multinationals. Um, hidden in the pricing and international exchange processes of the global capitalist economy is an enormous gross markup on labor costs amounting to higher exploitation in the south. Of course, it can be in the relative sense um, above average rates of exploitation focusing on increasing productivity or, or also in absolute sense paying workers less than the reproduction of labor power. So that's the macro level. Um, if you see what happened, um, that, uh, that multinational companies search for lower unit labor costs in the global south. Now, um, radical and critical scholars have also talked about this by pointing out um, by pointing out the nature of, of global production, which is flexibility, so or flexible production. So scholars like Bennett Harrison, um, he wrote Lean and Mean, um, talks about flexible production, and also German industrial sociologists, they talk about systemic rationalization. They are very similar. And I also combine this literature with the labor process, liter literature on labor process in monopoly capitalism. A lot of them um, are Marxist. So what is uh, flexible production? Um, so when we see that um, the organization of global commodity chains, uh, we see that firms search for greater flexibility through reorganization and technological change in labor management relations and in the firm's relationships with other companies and operating units. Um, so this kind of flexible production, um, you know, you can say that these are new corporate strategies aim at establishing production administration and distribution processes that are more flexible and economical. So we will see these examples in my study, but some of them are built in control mechanisms, delivery on demand system, ranking by suppliers, um, and so on. So these scholars argue that, and this is the most important part of their argument, is that the decentralization of production processes um, does not imply the end of unequal economic power among firms, let alone the different classes of workers who are employed in different segments of this network. Um, flexible production and this kind of rationalization has created hierarchical structures in the production chain consisting of dominant and dependent segments. So that's why combining um, this literature, um, I argue that it's important also to examine firms, right? So we, we still have to examine firms as the meso level um, to know how exactly um, the, you know, these mechanisms uh, realize uh, the production uh, in the production uh, sphere. 
Um, so my questions are, what are the mechanisms that allow core companies to maintain or enhance their oligopolistic position in labor value chains and ensure stably low unit labor costs? Also, how do processes that occur in labor value chains affect workers or the direct, the direct producers of commodities? When, when we talk about global production, especially in the global South, so a lot of the discussion that, that, um, that, ha that exists, um, they focus usually on um, you know, really tragic and extreme events like, like this one is the factory collapse um, in Dhaka. Or you know, you talk about the the Foxconn worker suicide. And these are very important things that happened, and you know, they they really are. Um, they highlight um, you know how global production processes happened. Or you know, you can you usually are um, uh, you usually see images of sweatshops um, like this. But what I want to also um, offer is that um, it doesn't have to be extreme for exploitation to happen because exploitation is central to, uh, to how global commodity chains work. So the firms that I studied, I studied uh, two firms in, 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 in Indonesia. Um, they are suppliers for multinationals and these are not quote unquote sweatshops. Um, these are just regular, you know, factories. Um, I don't think they they neglected to pay their workers or or any of those extreme cases. But the point is that even without these horrible working conditions, right, exploitation still happens and control mechanisms are still there. Um, and these companies are related to plastic. So Jaffa Film is a plastic company and Star Inc. Um, um, they, they made uh, packaging. So from plastic for um, multinational products of multinational corporations, um, a lot of them. So for example, this hand sanitizer, um, they made for example, they make something like this, like the packaging of this sanitizer, including the, um, the label and so on. So I observe um, documents um, and I, I observe the factories, but um, the most, uh, the main part of the study is that I interviewed top executives as key informants. And this is important because to understand this, the decision making right, that go within these firms, you have to talk to them. Um, uh, if, you want to, if you want to be critical of capital, of course, first of all, you have to understand how capital works, how they think, what their logic is. And I think studying suppliers in the Global South is, is, is interesting and important because they manage both relationships. On the one hand, they manage uh, relationships with their multinational clients. And on the other hand, they manage relationships with their workforce. Um, so... Um, a lot of times they have to, I mean, the exploitation happens in their factories um, precisely because they have to fulfill the demands given by multinationals. So that's what, uh, that's what I mean when we have to e examine the hidden abode of production, right? Referring to Marx, um, because Marx says that in, in Capital Volume 1, that you really have to follow Mr. Moneybags and the workers uh, to the hidden abode of production if you want to know how capital is produced, if you want to know the secret of profit making. So um, the first thing we, um, I want to explain is why global, uh, global South suppliers are really um, keen on having multinationals as clients, even though multinationals are not always kind or polite. Um, for examples, um, you know, this is a common thing that multinationals uh, say to their Global South suppliers. 
this is a quote um, from my interview. So multinationals um, representatives sometimes they say, well, can you help us or not? And if you can't fulfill these demands, then we'll go to someone else. And once we've done it, you, you know, don't you dare beg us for orders. Another time, for example, a multinational client asked them, you want this order? Like, you know, I give you two weeks of completion. Can you do that? And they said, we can't. And the representative was furious saying, I gave you the opportunity and you refused. And that's, that's multinational for you, according to my interviewee. If you take their offer, that's it. You have to serve them till death and sacrifice your other customers. All their demands, we have to meet them. They act as if they are king. Now, the question is that why do they still do this, even though they actually told me that they prefer local customers because the profits are bigger when they deal with local customers. But the first, um, you know, one of the reasons is that multinationals give them large repeat orders and that's really important for them. It gives them some kind of um, stability in a sense, even though you know, it comes with a lot of price. Um, but also something that they mention a lot is that multinationals kind of gave them um, gave them a brand. So these are their A-list customers, and if they have A-list customers, um, you know their business becomes more well known. For example, I mean in relation to their creditors, um, you know their creditors will say to them that, you, you know, you're different. We cannot compare you with your competitors because of your personal customers' profiles because you have multinational clients. And if they supply to multinationals, they said, we, you know, we can take that as brand equity. Then we can use it as a referral. We have supplied to customer A. So that's why multinationals are very important for them. Uh, so that's the starting point, right? Uh, to understand why they have multinational clients. Um, now, the next thing is that how, how, are, how, how is the relationship between them? Um, and I found that there's a lot of control given um, by multinationals to Global South suppliers. Um, you know, some people, uh, usually highlight the fact that, well, if you do arm's length contracts, if you do, if you outsource your production, um, then, you know, multinationals kind of are, um, uh, uh, they don't really get involved uh, that much, right, in the production processes, uh, which is true for some aspects um, of how this global commodity chains works. But, you um, but what I found is that multinationals actually have a lot of control over their suppliers. And in the end, they also control labor through their suppliers. So first of all, we have control of technological knowledge um, um, or know-how by dominant companies. Um, technology is controlled, uh, technological knowledge is controlled from, 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 from the top. And you also have control of production processes through specific mechanisms. And um, most importantly, you have control over the labor process of workers. Um, we'll relate this also to Tayloristic forms of work, um, including the de-skilling aspect of Taylorism. And Marx actually um, quote unquote predicted this, right? Um, it's included in, in, in Capital, Volume One in the Penguin edition, that um, he talks about the real subsumption of labor under capital. Um, it developed in, in all the forms evolved by relative surplus value, uh, increasing productivity. Um, and when Marx said this, he actually predicted um, Taylorism. So, um, we can also trace it back to Marx. Okay, so first of all, um, let's talk about the innovation and technology transfer. So is this really happening, right? Um, because some literature argue that global commodity chains make it um, possible for global South suppliers to innovate. And then so, you know, they, they benefit from technology transfer. 
And in this case, the suppliers identify themselves as, you know, producers of middle high products. They have a niche market. Um, they are not labor intensive. They claim that they're not labor intensive. They're capital intensive. At first, they talk a lot about, well, you know, we we give a lot of um, we have a lot of technological kind of um, uh, advancements in, in this in this company. Um, we innovate and so on, but. After I talked more with them, um, it became clear that what they meant by innovation um, is to fulfill customers' needs, the multinationals' needs. And um, a lot of times that's about a pressure to cut cost. So these companies have R&D department. Um, but what they do um, in the R&D department, um, they mainly caters to research or trials that meet customers' demands to cut costs. For example, making sure that the new specification for certain packaging materials, materials can indeed work without problem. So this um, after I talked more and more with them, um, it was also clear that there was this idea, that there was this fear, you can say, um, that they, they think that they're just seamstress. Um, it's, it's their own term. So seamstress in Indonesian is tukang jahit. And it denotes a person who accepts various um, sewing orders, usually menial jobs, from customers at their little shop. And they are usually distinguished from like, you know, skilled tailors. So uh, there was this concept, uh, this term was kind of um, secretively um, uh, going around within the companies uh, that, you know, they were kind of disappointed that, well, we're actually just a seamstress. We're just fulfilling order. We just, re you know, um, making sure that the multinational requests are done properly. So the way I see it, they say when we deal with multinationals, um, it feels that we're just a seamstress. And here's another quote about um, in relation to um, fulfilling demands in relation to quote unquote innovation. So the, multi the multinational customer told us to come and meet them. They say, we want to make this packaging product. Let's say it used to be 12 microns in thickness. This is about plastic. So now they wanted it to be eight microns to cut cost. And then they asked us to share, well, how much you can you save? It was to the point that they called the supplier of that eight microns material to come meet us so that Star Inc could buy from them. If then our factory produces too much waste, they would tell us to come again. They, event, they demanded that we fix that problem. So this is an example of how, you know, what innovation really means. It's just, they, they were just forcing them to, to find a way so that, you know, eight microns, you know, the thinner materials works as well as the thicker materials for their packaging. Um, and another form of control is bureaucratic control. And an example of this is open costing requirements. Multinationals require their suppliers to give them a detailed list of costs, usually using the clean business reason. So they would say, you know, we don't want a corrupt, you know, process. So we have to know all your cost. And they will, they have the ability to compare, they have, they have the information, they have the ability to compare costs among suppliers and question costs that are not deemed low enough. And they can, through this practice, they can also pit suppliers against each other, right? They can say, look, the Malaysian factory or this Thai, Thailand uh, factory can give us a better, um, a better price. Why can't you give us this price? And this is so extreme that they can, the multinationals can actually determine the profit margins of their suppliers. So their profit margins are actually determined from the beginning. So the multinational will say, you know, you can only have, you know, such and such uh, percent of, of profit and that's it. That's why a lot of times they, they think that, you know, dealing with local customers are better because they can have 
higher profits. And um, this is also another important finding is that um, these Global South suppliers have to offer higher flexibility to survive. So this is in relation to flexible production. They have to play that game and they have to play it well. So flexibility in production and delivery surface um, uh, are needed to win over multinationals and survive competition with other suppliers. So Star Inc. actually had um, a big competitors called Sun Printing, also a pseudonym. But Sun Printing is a multinational to begin with. Um, and since it's a multinational from one of the countries in the triad, um, they have stable customers from their own country and they can afford not to be flexible. You know, they can reject multinational um, clients and reject their requests. They, they don't have problems with that. So uh, global South suppliers like Star Inc have to you know, have to be really flexible. They have to sell that flexibility in order to compete with, with um, other suppliers. So they call themselves strategic supplier. Whatever our competitors cannot supply due to unreasonable time constraints, we must be able to take over. So being uh, flexible, um, this is a part of, of what, what scholars call functional flexibility, right? It trans, it's a transfer of responsibility in relation to costs and waste to suppliers. So some examples include delivery on demand. So multinationals will just say, you know, you have to deliver this much at this time. We don't want to, you to deliver it early, for example. Um, so as a result, global south suppliers have to have more warehouses to, to keep their, um, their supplies until the time is right to send it to them, um, to their clients. And then they also have buffer service to offset missed forecasts and meet fluctuating market demands. So even though multinationals have, have um, forecasts, but they can be missed um, and they miss forecasts a lot of times. But the responsibility to offset that, forecast, that missed forecast is given to their suppliers and buffering is a big part of it. Um, all of them talk about this buffering service. Um, so buffering service, uh, we, we can understand this through this quote actually. So this is a quote from one of the, I think the planning department. Our marketing team always reminds us that we have agreed that we need to buffer up to 20%, but the order for um, this multinational is humongous. The amount needed to supply um, to them in a month is almost equivalent to one warehouse. On the one hand, it's a problem to anticipate a 20% increase by storing all of the goods there. But on the other hand, we also must be ready to anticipate a decrease by 20% of what they promise us to take in the following month. So um, uh, Star Inc, for example, has this policy of, of um, you know, being flexible by 20%. If the multinationals say we have to cut our orders by 20%, they have to do it. Or if they, you know, they need a rush order and increase it by 20%, then they have to do that. So considering all of these um, examples, you can see that systemic rationalization or flexible production pursues contradictory goals. So the first goal is the increase of flexibility in company administration and manufacturing process to fulfill constantly changing market requirements with respect to quality and quantity. But then they also um, have the goal of um, achieving a more cost effective production system under conditions of fiercer competition. And this is very contradictory. So on the one hand, you're, you're, um, you need to be flexible, but on the other hand, you need to be cost effective. But flexibility you know, results in a lot of waste, waste in labor, waste in products. And they have to stop, of course, if you know how, how factory works, uh, like factories like this work, 
you know, they have to stop the whole production just to, you know, uh, change it uh, for another uh, order uh, that require that that is rush order, right? So it, it disrupted the whole production. And here's a quote from uh, one of the production manager or director. He said, well, we sometimes have to make sacrifices, meaning we allow the waste to be high because we have to cut the ongoing production of a certain product in order to fit in a different product. And here's another example. If all of a sudden, say because of certain promotional periods that increase market demands, one packaging size is needed more than the others, this customer would suddenly change their plans. This week, I need you to send me the 20 grams one instead of seven grams one. If you're a rigid supplier, you would definitely say no because it would disrupt the whole production process. They have to reprint stuff, everything. Most converting companies would refuse to do this because it would create inefficiencies and plenty of waste, but they have to do it in order to fulfill their customers' needs. So those are about control over production processes, control over technology, technology. And in the end, of course, the question is, who bears the burden of the contradiction and other consequences of these demands? Um, of course, the question is workers um, at, you know, direct producers of these commodities. And if you remember, if you recall what I called about um, the, the open cost requirements, um, a lot of these suppliers don't have other options, right? I mean, they have to accept the cost that, that demanded, um, uh, the, the cost requirements, the low cost requirements demanded by their multinational clients. So, um, so what they can do is, of course, to um, to force their workers to work um, as productive and as efficient as possible. Um, you know, they don't, in other cases, of course, people can decrease the wages, right? Um, but in their case, um, they didn't decrease wages um, and there were increases in minimum wage and they did, uh, you know, they accepted that. But as a result, demanded directly by multinationals, um, they want more productive workforce. And of course, in the end, this is about lowering the unit labor costs, right? So it doesn't matter if wage increase, if productivity increase as well, then labor costs can be, um, can be kept low. So the burden uh, is given to the workers on the shop floor whose labor remains unskilled and are detached from the decision-making process, which is exclusive to the management. And this is done through various means, mostly through the reorganization of work in order to increase productivity, especially to offset the increase in wages and to meet clients' demands. These are some examples. Um, one is bureaucratic control. Um, these are through international certifications such as ISO, URSA, SEDEX. Um, this is uh, one of the main mechanisms in, in, in uh, outsourcing of production, right? Multinationals will just give third party um, uh, you know, um, to audit um, their suppliers. So the suppliers have to, um, have to, uh, have to fulfill requirements, um, you know, and a lot of time this is about safety um, and so on. But, you know, of course, some of these are good for workers because they have some kind of standards. They have regulations about safety, about overtime, you know, and so on. But um, when we see behind all of these um, things, uh, we can ask, what is the real reason behind such certifications? Um, when I talk to, you know, directors from human resource department, for example, they, they don't hide the real reasons. They say, well, yeah, we, you know, we, we need, you know, safe and healthy work um, environment so that workers can keep can keep working so that they have good productivity. And actually, when I was um, doing my field work, they were undergoing one of these audits, and they have this big, you know, uh, 
what do you call it, like big slogan printed in, in their factory. It says safe and healthy work is a mandatory conditions for an increase in productivity and efficiency. Um, so that's the real reason. There were several other studies that show um, similar things, for example, in food industries, right? Um, they, you know, a lot of times the certification only care about the safety of the food production, but not, not really the well-being of workers. And um, as Harry Braverman says, um, the humanization of work is never the goal. Right of 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 this kind of cases because it's based on antagonistic relationship between workers and um, and capital to begin with. And then there's also technical control, machines as a means to control the labor process away from the shop floor. This can be done, for example, through uh, incentive system and key performance index based evaluations. Um, one interesting example is about this incentive system. When I was doing uh, the interviews, um, multinationals were really strict at that point about overtime, about limiting overtime. Um, and um, so, you know, a lot of times Global South suppliers, also low wage workers depend on overtime work. So to increase their, their, um, their income. And when you limit overtime, um, I know this is this sounds ironic, but you know workers really um, are upset because you know they lose that opportunity to gain more income. So when I was doing the field work, um, their competitor um, limited overtime just like that, and there was a big strike, massive strike in the factory because of that, and they had to lay off about a, more than a thousand workers. So Star Inc. at that time was really nervous about this. So they had to come up with something, right? They, they didn't want what happened to their competitors have happened to them. So they have to limit, uh, they have to do something to offset this new regulation or, or not, not new regulation, the regulation is actually old, but at that time, multinationals were really straight about us, uh, um, really strict about it. So they came out with this incentive system. Um, they, they will give incentives to all workers based on production output, variant waste and returns. And just a little thing about this. Um, this is a really good example of how workers have to juggle, right? Production output and waste. So they will get extra money, right? Extra wage um, if they have good performance. And to do this, for example, they have to make sure the production output is high. And you can do this by setting the machines higher, a uh, higher speed, right? So they have to keep up with the machines. Um, but on the other hand, they also have to control the waste. And you can um, have very minimum waste by setting the machine very low, but then you won't have a lot of production, a, a lot of um, productivity that way. So this way, workers have to juggle this um, to make sure that they have the incentives. So this is an example of how you control the labor process without directly controlling them at the factory floor, right? This is a control um, made, through decision, made through decisions by management, right? Away from the factory floor. Um, Peter Custer has already talked about this as well, and, and he calls this internal decentralization. But if all else fails, then you have forms of simple control on factory floor. I mean, not fail, but if it's not enough, um, then you also have um, direct control. For example, my um, these executives, they told me that even after being encouraged by the incentive system, there's no guarantee that workers can work well. That's why we need management's presence. Every single deviation needs to be evaluated. If workers want to be paid more, I need to know how high their labor productivity is per hour. It needs to be measured first. And then of course they, they say, you know, things like Indonesians can still obey orders if you watch their back. So there's this, really um, assumption about workers not, be, not, not being able to work properly 
and not having enough intelligence or skills or, um, or ability to do work properly. Uh, sorry to interrupt. If you could wrap up in the next few minutes so that we've got time for the discussion and questions. Please. Yeah, sure. Thanks. This is almost done. So um, thank you. Um, so uh, this is um, maybe the last thing I would I would talk about in relation to control of labor process is that um, you know management often says, well, you know, their work is very simple, you know, and repetitive. But the question is that, is it really simple work or, or something else? But what we see is the de-skilling, right? Um, work in factories like this is simple, not merely because it is the nature of the job um, or the machine, but, but um, it, is, it is a, a detachment of, of the brain, of, of the hand from the brain. So workers are um, away from decision making. They, they're, they're not involved in the decision making. Decision making is made by executives, by management, and workers get to, to perform this uh, so-called simple work because it's a de-skilled work. And according to Braverman, this is the pivot point upon uh, which all modern management turns the control over work to the control over the, de the decisions that are made um, in the course of work. And of course, the threats of unions and management usually uh, try to, uh, to prevent um, union organizing through different types of rhetoric. And I can talk about this um, in the question and answer if, if you're interested. So the conclusion is that um, there's unequal relations between dominant and dependent companies, and they have these control mechanisms that I explained. And what we see is actually the externalization of cost. And I think we all know that capital um, prefers that, right? They want to externalize cost and they transfer responsibilities and the problem of waste, both labor and products to their global south suppliers. So this is my last slide. Um, I probably won't be able to talk a lot about this, but um, you know the macro level and the firm level studies uh, kind of show that imperialism is not an obsolete concept. Um, imperialism um, or the hierarchical um, structure, right, of 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 uh, world economy, um, it's never about. Um, expansion into other countries or the exaction of tribute when we talk about capitalist imperialism. Um, in the age of multinational corporations and globalized production, um, the dominated areas are transformed, adapted, and manipulated to serve the imperatives of capital accumulation at the center. And at the firm level, uh, production in the global south is transformed, adapted, and manipulated down to the smallest detail. Um, they're parachuted often in, with no real organic relation or logic stemming from the emerging or peripheral economy and are just as easily dismantled and removed. So this created the illusion of development, but with arm's length production, what is being produced are mere links in a global chain of value in which particular nodes of production are specified and controlled from abroad. Um, so that's my conclusion. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for that, Intan. It was uh, fascinating. Um, yes, yeah, so next uh, we'll hear from Susan for her discussion, um, but I'd like to encourage everyone to put, uh, add their questions in the chat box uh, uh, that can be expanded on in the Q&A. So over to you, Susan. Thanks very much. Um, thanks, Alison. Thanks, Intan, very much for your presentation. I did very much enjoy the book. Um, I did prepare this, uh, my response before I heard your presentation. So some of my queries do go beyond your presentation, but perhaps it gives you more of an opportunity to speak about imperialism because I think that's where parts of my questions go. So just to sort of wind back and have a look at, I want to sort of understand your contribution to the global value chain research more broadly defined. You know, this is a body of work that's now emerged from adolescence into maturity if we date its birth to the 1994 uh, monograph edited by uh, Gareffi and Kozovanic, so 26 now. And um, it's not no longer a concept discussed at the margins of scholarship as it had been. And there now exists a very well-known mainstream variant imprinted with a neoliberal approach to economic development. There are regular publications and reports from the WTO, the World Bank, 
and well-funded databases that measure their extent. Some of this data you've been able to use in your own analysis as, as a buy. Um, um, but it's also a concept that's been instrumentalized in right-wing political rhetoric around deglobalization or renationalization of production. So it's still a massively contentious, uh, not only uh, 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 approach, if not a contentious phenomena. Um, although it, we can argue about that too. Um, so there've been some very significant developments in the critical analysis of the phenomenon of global value chains, which is not limited to Marx's approaches. And Inton, you cite quite a bit of this in your book. And I just remember from about a decade or so ago, and I think other colleagues in the audience here will also remember, and I'm sure that you also see, see this, saw this sort of call to action to Marxist scholars from about a decade ago, that was really trying to respond to the apparent absence of an adequately theorized theory of value in GBC research. So in the work, you know, it, as, as Bear, Jennifer Bear in 2005 outlined, you know, if GBC research sought to understand the where, how, and why, no, sorry, the where, how, and by whom value is created and distributed along commodity chains, then surely it would require a better theorized conception of the social processes regulating the generalized production and exchange of commodities. And this is a starting point of a, a lot of work that's been doing, that's been happening, including your own uh, intern here. And much of the starting point has been on this sort of apparent negative correlation between income received and the amount of labor time associated with activities in different nodes of the chain. So I'm just gonna share my screen because I usually find it helpful to have a picture to hang on to when I'm talking. There we go. How do I make this, uh, there we go. So this is a, I, I really like this very simple diagram and it's from a special issue in the monthly review that Intent also contributed to that, uh, that juxtaposes the, the technicist or smile curve of value addition and price of the neoclassical view and a more objective theory of value associated with Marx's theory of value. And we see very clearly the divergence of the two patterns and we look not only along commodity chains um, and particularly as they map onto uh, geographical space. So I could, uh, maybe I should stop showing that. So, th so Inton's work is, along with the others, have taken this critical agenda forward by focusing on the labor process and exploitation along the chains. And I wanted, to, I thought it's just worth mentioning some of that work here, particularly because there are a few people in the audience who I think have been, have done very significant work in this area, uh, including Alessandra Mazadri, who has used a feminist approach to study the labor process and rates of exploitation in the Indian garment industry. John Smith, from whom I think his work influenced very much the labor value uh, commodity chain approach that you've taken and Ben Selwyn with his related concept of poverty chains. I think there's a clear kind of uh, set of uh, arguments and debates that are being taken forward and theorized more carefully with careful field work here, which we can include your work now as well. And by employing a labor theory of value, all of you, all these scholars have analyzed the labor process mechanisms and modes of exploitation and practices in the expropriation of value from global south to global north. And what you've done, I think, which wasn't in the in the presentation just now, but is really to, to extend some of this by putting to work the concept of the value chain in an analysis of economic imperialism and capital, contemporary capitalism. And, uh, and you've done this quite explicitly to link the relate, these relationships of exploitation and labor process to wider systemic analyses of capitalist accumulation as it occurs at a world scale, right? So these different dynamics and relations articulation between its moving parts, capital and labor in this case, based on this analytical device of the labor, labor value chain that you've talked about. And I think in so doing, you make a number of uh, useful critical points and contributions. I'm just gonna outline quickly. Uh, there are many more, of course, but one is uh, the connection of labor value chains as a form of unequal exchange. That's considered uh, one of the main imperious mechanisms that remain in place today. Uh, you very carefully debunk the mainstream economic business analysis approaches to efficiency and productivity related to industrial organization. And, uh, and you reveal very well what's behind these words and practices through this, both through an analysis of the business, mainstream business literature, as well as through the you know, concrete practices of, of firms that you've, you've uh, studied. Um, and you've revealed what's behind these words and that's exploitation. And I think what you've also brought in you that's not usually seen within this global value chain literature 
is the insights from German industrial sociologists. So I thought that was extremely important and the, how the idea of systemic rationalization can be used to show that good work and bad work are two sides of the same coin, that there is this uh, systematic, systemic relationship between the two. It's not this every leveling up of this uh, utopian, optimistic, pure and Sabel view of, you know, post-Fordism. So you look at the meso level processes in relation to the logic of capital accumulation, and you explicitly to uh, explicitly attempt to analyze the articulation between different scales, uh, from a macro chain as a whole to meso chain constituents. And I think this is a really useful articulation. I think that's something that's often people often don't seek to try and do that, and it, it's it's extremely ambitious, but also I think really really important that we keep on probing that and working at that level. So if I can quote you here, in your book on page 69, you say, we cannot gain a comprehensive understanding of the development of commodity chains if we fail to see the process of capital accumulation that underlines this phenomenon. And I would agree, uh, agree completely with that statement. And you take another, I think, important approach you've taken, and you, you explain that in your presentation, is taking the vantage point of productive capital and from perspectives of the South. So how Southern capitals operate to intermediate the labor process. Um, and I think that's very useful and that there are other examples of this also, but I think this is, yeah, again, this is a very important um, sort of way into understanding these dynamics of unequal exchange and what we might understand as economic imperialism. And you also cite incentive literature from the global South. So I really liked the way you use a metaphor, the drain of surpluses and how you then connect that theoretically um, further. So in this and, and lots of ways, this book has made, has a lot to offer on the contemporary dynamics of our uneven development. And while I am sympathetic uh, to the concept of imperialism, and I fully, fully agree with your criticism of the imperialism deniers in your book, um, I'm not fully convinced, or perhaps I don't really understand how imperialism here, as you understand it and connect it, it differs from the old imperialism of Baron and Sweezy. So um, that's something I think uh, I'd really like you to take forward. And one way which this might be elaborated to help me understand, or perhaps this is where your next book will go, is um, in terms of a more precise specification of the integrated industrial circuit of capital as a whole and the articulation between its constituent interdependent parts. Um, in the first instance, you know, between the circuits of money, commodity and productive capital. I'm being very abstract here, so I'll, I'll flesh that out um, uh, with, I'm more than halfway through, so hopefully we're okay for time. <laughs> okay, so I think we've got a lot to learn, and this is a sort of pet project uh, from volume two of Capital. I think a lot of value chain analysis is really focused very much on volume one and, uh, and on the labor process, and I think that's quite right. I think that's really important. Um, but, uh, you know, if we look at the world around us and you've, you've documented there the rise of global value chains as a phenomenon, that rise uh, occurred contemporaneously with so-called financialization and all the work that's been done around uh, the financialization of accumulation, where Marx is again focused now a bit more on volume three. And I think actually we need to bring all this together and look at volume two as, as, as un in, in understand the articulation. Of, of, of these uh, circuits of capital. So uh, my, I mean, excuse me for bringing my own work, but I just thought it'd be useful for a different vantage point here. So my own work has really tended to approach um, some similar questions from the vantage point of commodity capital. So whilst you're looking very clearly from the vantage point of productive capital within industrial circuit capital, I've looked in my work much more from the perspective of commodity capital. Um, so I focus much more on the sphere of circulation rather than the sphere of production, which is, I think, where most of your analysis is located. So uh, I've therefore studied mechanisms of value capture and the siphoning off of surplus in concrete processes of valuation along commodity chains. And this has informed my own uh, tendency to study agro-commodities, coffee, cocoa, milk powder, more recently human breast milk, you know, because these, this is how, you know, if you're looking from the perspective of commodity, this is often the clearest, most simple way of understanding these dynamics. But what I think commodity capital helps us do is it, it acts as a, as a bridge between money capital and the analysis of financialization of capital accumulation and the circuit of productive capital, the focus of your work here. But a focus on commodity capital alone 
could lead us to a sort of functional understanding of internationalization as this movement of surplus across national borders. And this is sort of some of the limitations of the work by people like Emmanuel uh, as theories of unevil, uh, uneven exchange. So it's looking, it looks at this in a very sort of functional form rather than providing more distributive, distributional insights that come from a focus on the circuit of productive capital, which you've highlighted here and the labor process. Um, and it only becomes apparent that the process of valuation along commodity chains work to force the cheapening and skinning of labor in the global south in the ways that you've described here if we take an integrated approach of these circuits. Um, at, but without an analysis of the internationalization of money capital, international value and world prices, we would not, wouldn't have any sense of how, you know, the transfer price for developing uh, differentiation of systems production occurs, right? So, so this sort of the, the problem of, of the law of value at the level of the world economy uh, creates, um, reproduces these uneven structures of production um, and, and, and such like. And uh, so there, you know, we, you know, only if we look there can we see that there is this chaotic character of the internalization of capital that's apparent from looking at the money circuit. So I would argue, I think, that in order for us to fully appreciate the nature of contemporary capitalist accumulation, its contradictions and concrete character of crises and restructuring, and the analytical purchase of your theorization of empirical imperialism today, we would need to develop this work further to better conceptualize this articulation between the circuits of capital. And this is where I think Capital Volume 2, two or the work of Palois in the 70s is particularly useful. Uh, I don't want to, I was going to scare you with some graphs of M's and C's and things, but I think I won't do that. But I will just share my screen for the last slide I have here, um, which is a, so uh, hang on, how do I move from, oh, there we go. So ignore that. <laughs> but uh, I'm just sharing the screen because this is just, um, this is actually, this slide is actually comes almost it, from something else I worked on a few years ago and presented on. But I thought it was a really useful way for me to sort of assess Inton's contribution in this book and where we might want to take it further. Um, so just to finish off, uh, Paolo, so, so whilst, as I say, I'm not denying the existence of imperialism, we do need to specify it more carefully to enhance the analytical purchase rather than imperialism being this simple prism through which all international economic relations promised on an equal power and hierarchical structures is viewed, right? So just because hierarchy, uh, hierarchical structures exist does not imply imperialism exists. So we need to, so I, I'd like a bit more about the relationships there and how we theorize that. And, um, and I thought what was really useful from Palois' work is this distinction from functional and structural analyses, right? So he's looking at the internationalization of uh, capital but I think it, it does provide a very useful framework to assess um, Etan's uh, contribution to a broader agenda to theorize imperialism in contemporary capitalism. So one of the questions I would ask is to what extent does Etan's analysis represent a functional analysis of internationalization of capital? And here I think we can see many, many examples of that. And I think uh, Etan's work does move towards a more structural understanding as well, one that allows us to understand, to include the essence of the contradictory process of capitalism, of an internationalization. Um, but I think we could do a bit more work into analytically linking both of these and then specifying what then is meant by imperialism. So if I wanted to end that with, um, if I wanted to sort of rephrase that as a question or two questions, I would probably say my first question is to intern is, in what ways does your analysis differ and surpass that of dependency theory? And the other question would probably be, how would you see the money and commodity circuits of capital figuring in your analysis? I'll stop there. I'll stop sharing. Can you repeat the second one, Susan? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. How would you see the money and commodity circuits of capital figuring in your analysis? Do I stop this? There we go. Thank you, Susan. Um, yeah, well, I'll I'll pass over to Intan to uh, respond to some of your questions. 
Well, first of all, thank you so much, Susan, um, for the wonderful discussion. Um, I think um, some of these questions I can answer, some of them I probably cannot answer um, comprehensively or completely because I think this is where um, my study can be developed, as you said yourself. Um, this is a brief, really a brief book, and um, it needs a lot of, um, a lot of the, the parts need to be elaborated in, in, um, in further uh, research. So in terms of, let me say a few things about the imperialism aspect. Um, I think I, I do borrow from Baron and Sweezy and also Harry Macduff, um, of course, um, in relation to their theory of imperialism. So the theoretical framework is pretty much um, the same. I, 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 I use their theory, but um, in my book, what, what is new imperialism is also very um, related to John Smith's work, right? And um, the idea that um, the way global commodity chains is organized through arm's length contracts, especially, um, that makes it, um, you know, you can see how 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 capital is really searching for stably low unit labor cost, and um, this is a form of um, imperious relations um, in terms. Uh, coming back again to Macduff, that you know, capitalist imperialism is about transforming and adapting. Uh, in this case, global South areas um, to fulfill um, the needs of, of, of the global North through different mechanisms. And in, in terms of production, um, you know, the system is designed especially so it can just be dismantled. And of course, um, if, you, if you look back at John Smith's work, for example, um, this is also, this is about capturing value. Um, and, um, you know, the way this is organized, um, the, the contribution um, from labor is very low. And then in the end, um, it affects um, in the GDP accounting as well. Um, so this terms of value capture, I mean, in this process of value capture, this is a form of expropriation um, and um, also related to, relate, related, related to um, Utsa and Prabhat Patnaik's work, you know, um, imperialism still exists in relation to, to colonialism, but also, um, through unequal exchange, as you said uh, yourself, right? Um, so unequal exchange, um, this is a form of unequal exchange. And I think there is, um, it's, it's a, I think we can argue that unequal exchange is a form of imperialism. Um, I, don't, I don't see how, you know, how that is some kind of a super, theory. Um, it is a form of imperialism and it's, you know, um, it's not, it's not a theory, it's not the theory of imperialism, but um, imperialist relations where um, global north powers can, can just um, uh, go to global south and sometimes with threats, um, a lot of times with threats, um, also through different mechanisms like trade agreements um, or financial institutions like IMF or World Bank, um, then that's also, um, I think we can say it's, it's a form of imperialist relations. So I hope that <laughs> answers a little bit, but um, the focus is here on, on this, um, the search for low um, unit labor cost. Um, and, um, and this is made possible partly from uh, arm's length contracts. And that's what has been, um, what has been increasing um, recently. 
even in the mainstream uh, tradition of global commodity chains, they, because you know traditionally they kind of separate between production-driven and buyer-driven chains um, to distinguish, you know, like labor-intensive industries like garment and and so on from um, high-tech industries. But with this new um, new globalization, where arms lines contracts are more prominent, um, even that distinction is no longer uh, is no longer useful, right? Because the organization has become more and more buyer-like. Um, and I think that that um, that adds to this understanding of um, global commodity chains as an as an you know imperialistic world economy. So that's one thing. Um, and I think that also it can answers um, how how this approach um, differ from dependency theory. Um, I don't see it as as um, qualitatively different, probably, but um, um, but in this case. Um, I also want to highlight uh, the role of Global South suppliers um, in their, uh, as an actor, right, in global commodity chains. So um, I don't see this, I don't see this organization as, as merely, um, you know, like a narrow kind of sense of, of the North versus the South, but, um, um, but Global South suppliers here um, uh, are also responsible and um, in controlling the labor process, especially. So they are, uh, you know, they are this, this uh, major um, component in making sure that exploitation happens. Um, and uh, that's something that that I think needs to be studied more in the literature. Um, you know, it's not like we we uh, we kind of glorify uh, global south suppliers, right? I mean, they are um, they are pretty much um, um, pressured by multinationals and um, and so on. But again, they are also an actor and who is making sure that exploitation can actually happen at the production point. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, because theoretically, um, I, don't, I don't think that, you know, it's, it's necessary for me to, to separate my approach um, from, from dependency uh, theory. And in terms of money and commodity chains, oh, sorry, money and commodity circuits. Actually, I just had a, a conversation with a colleague um, a few weeks ago about volume two of capital and how, um, how uh, it can be incorporated um, in my work. And I think that's, that's really, <laughs> that's correct, right? I mean, I, don't, I didn't do that and I should have done that. But this is something that that needs to be done separately um, in a in a in a bigger in a bigger project as well. Fantastic! Uh, I hope that answered some of your questions, Susan. Um, before we move, uh, I just wanted to quickly ask a question of my own, if that's if that's all right, um, because I was uh, interested to pick up on. Um, what you said about the sort of take it or leave it relationship between these multinational corporations and suppliers um, and sort of contextualize that uh, within the COVID-19 crisis um, and whether you think that the current crisis and the drop in demand sort of globally, um, how that sort of transmitted to suppliers uh, mainly in the global south and whether you think that that relationship sort of the unequal power in that relationship has almost intensified um, because I was interested uh, you also mentioned unions um, and I've seen quite a few examples from the garment industry of um, in the context of COVID-19 and less orders there's been many examples of union busting um, with obvious 
uh, implications for the workers in that sector. Um, so do you have any reflections on that? So just to clarify, so you're talking about the, the current supply chain crisis and hmm. um, how that's gonna, you, uh, how's that gonna change the current system, you think? Yeah, so that obviously there was already a very uneven power structure within these uh, global commodity chains, whether that's gonna, it's the power is even more skewed towards uh, the buyers and the corporations uh, in this, mm -hmm. in this context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's actually something that um, that I'm currently trying to examine. So it's still in the very initial stage uh, of the work. Um, so I I'll be hesitant to actually you know claiming that I, I can predict what's gonna happen, um, but we can I think we can um, we can assume that capital will continue to to look for uh, low unit labor costs. But the thing is, with this global supply chain um, disruptions, there's a lot of um, a lot of panicking, right? I mean, because they learned that actually they have learned before from Fukushima and all of that, but and now with the pandemic, the scale is really big. So they know that it's not a good idea to, um, to depend on only certain countries, and in this case, um, especially China. So, but what, what has been happening, I think, from what I followed is that um, different global South countries now are, lo are looking at this as an opportunity and um, and they um, you know a lot of a lot of countries like India, for example, already um, already uh, issued a lot of incentives, um, millions of millions um, of intensives um, for corporations to invest in the country, right? Because they want to. Um, I mean, the goal is to be able to replace China, probably. Um, and a lot of investments have been flowing to countries like this um, because of the U.S.-China, you know, trade war. Uh, Vietnam has been like a lot of multinationals have been going to Vietnam um, and so on. And then you know, countries like Malaysia uh, promote their their infrastructure for their semiconductor industries, you know, in the hope to 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 um, uh, to promote themselves so investments can can move to these countries. But the, the question is, of course, well, can we change the structure that easily, especially if we, um, if we think about the infrastructure in general, right? A lot of the countries don't have the infrastructure needed um, to become a huge suppliers like this. Um, so we don't know to what extent um, the change can happen. But changes have been happening in terms of, you know, governments uh, desperate trying to, to, again, promote their countries. And Indonesia, for example, the unit labor cost has been a little higher, right, compared to China and India. And I think uh, yeah, they're pretty desperate um, to attract capital. And they just, for example, issued a new law that 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 will be devastating for for labor and the environment precisely to attract investments. So you can see that these things have been going on. Um, so if if say for example they are ready, um, then there there's really nothing. I would say there's nothing incredibly new that will happen because then there you know it's just a changing places. Um, and um, and capital is still going to be able to to search for low unit labor cost. Mm. Um, so we've had a few questions. We're really running out of time. I'm sorry, everybody. But um, what I would be really interested to ask, because it's sort of looking forward, um, Benjamin Selwyn asked, do you have any thoughts about how GVCs can be democratized and brought under control of workers? By the way, I didn't know that Ben is here. Hi, Ben. It's so good to have you. <laughs> um, and, um, I, you know, in my book, I also use Ben's work and, um, you know, his work has been very important to me as well. Um, so he asked whether uh, 
global value chains can be democratized and brought more under the control of workers. Um, you know, I think with uh, Ben himself, has been uh, has been writing about workers' movements um, in a lot of countries, right, including factory occupations, uh, say like in Argentina. Um, I think that that is probably you know a starting point. But when we talk about the global commodity chains themselves, um, I mean that's something that 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 we need to to think more about, especially, you know, with, with scholars who have been doing work in terms of logistic labor, right, and, and um, the strategies that workers have been doing to, to control this logistics or as, as, as a means to, um, to, uh, to put forward their demands. I mean, that's, of course, they are important and uh, they can they can be um, they can be a starting point, like I said. Um, but also, of course, we have to think about well, how real? I mean, how can we get global commodity chains um, under more under the control of workers um, uh, beyond uh, you know the fact that uh, these struggles are happening and you know factories can be occupied, logistic workers can organize. Um, but as long as um, you know technological control, that's one thing. As long as multinationals still um, still control technological knowledge, then of course uh, it's hard for us to for our, for workers to control GVCs. Um, you know, forms of de-skilling uh, has to has to be has to be challenged uh, um, uh, significantly um, so yeah I, you know um, that's a tough question um, but I think that's the two things that 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 matter the most the the control of technology and you know because control of production processes then if workers can already um, occupy factories that's that's one one way to alleviate it, but control of technology is a big thing. Uh, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, it's almost half past five already. Um, I'm sorry we haven't had time to get to all of the questions, um, but it's been super fascinating. Thank you so much, Intan, and thank you, Susan, uh, both of you for your insights. Uh, before we leave, I'll just quickly let everybody know about the next webinar in the series, which will be on the 16th of December at 5pm. Uh, the topic is territories that won't be left behind, well-being and planning in Nuche, Colombia, a uh, webinar and launch of the documentary film uh, on alternative approaches to development originating from local context in the Colombian Pacific. Um, sounds Fascinating. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, hopefully, you'll all be here at the next one. So, take care. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's been so lovely to chat to you. Yes, yeah, same here. And thank you, Susan. Thanks for having me. Thank okay. you, Susan. <laughs>